afternoon, everyone. Um, very, very nice to see you all. Uh, I'm Karthik Raman. I'm a faculty at, as you can see on the screen, I'm a faculty at the Department of Biotechnology at the Bhupatan Jyoti Mehta School of Bio Biological Sciences. I also coordinate the Center for Integrative Biology and Systems Medicine. And um, I'm also a co member at the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and um, AI. So today, I'm going to talk to you about um, networks in general. And uh, because I think not many of you may be yet very interested in biology. So I'm going to talk a bit about networks in general and well how they can be applied to biological networks. But uh, basic network science is what I'm going to mostly uh, focus on. I think I'm audible even at the uh, back, right? There should be no issues, but this is trying to get the uh, mic sorted. So let's get started. All of you, I think I've learned graph theory, you know, I think uh, Madhavan has ta taught you graph theory. I've seen those uh, slides. So you know what a graph is, what an adjacency matrix is and all of that. And I don't know if you've seen this uh, very interesting uh, history of graph theory. So it's always nice to start with a story. <coughs> the problem set in uh, uh, the beautiful city of uh, Prussian city of uh, Königsberg in 1735. Today it's in Kaliningrad, around what is known as the Pregel River. Those days people were had lots of time on their hands, you know, really enjoyed life, and they had this question: um, Can I set out from my house after dinner, take a walk? cross every bridge in the city and come back home, okay? This was their question. And if you can see, there are a few, um, you should be able to see the bridges. This is one bridge, one more bridge. So there are seven bridges. So it's called the seven bridges of um, Konigsberg. It's very, very uh, famous. Uh, and this was the question that they had. And so what happened was, um, I always say that no discussion of any mathematics can be complete without uh, paying our respects to Euler. Uh, and Euler's, uh, yeah. And um, Euler's solution to the problem laid the foundation of um, what we today call graph theory. So what did Euler do? Uh, this was actually Euler's uh, caricature. He drew this uh, from taking this map of the city Euler drew this sort of a map for himself. So here A, B, C are all some sort of islands and he used small a, b, c. You may not be able to see that very clearly. It's a very old print. So this is small a, this is small b and uh, so on. Um, he used those to indicate the bridges. Okay. So he wrote this very, look at the language of this letter, very interesting letter. He said, uh, he wrote to the, the mayor of the city wrote to Euler saying, my citizens have this question. Can you help them find such a path if it exists? And then Euler wrote back saying, thus you see most noble sir, how this type of solution bears little relationship to mathematics. He said it is not math at all. Today's mathematicians including me will cringe. And I don't understand why you expect a mathematician to produce it. But very nice, uh, he said it's based on reason and all of that. Be but because of this, I do not know why even questions that are so unrelated to maths are still solved better by mathematicians. You know, very tongue in cheek there from uh, Euler. And uh, he notes very interestingly, and this is our, uh, say, the segue for um, uh, graph theory into modern science. He says this question was very banal, but it seemed to be worthy of attention because he could not solve it using just geometry or just algebra or just the art of counting. So he needed to actually work hard to solve this problem. Euler needed to work hard to solve this problem. So it became a field. So what did Euler do? He really didn't do this, but today we represent it in this fashion. So this is very convenient. All of you are very familiar with this. These are, there are four um, nodes in this graph and seven edges. Of course, this is a little weird, no? What is weird about this graph from the graphs that you have studied in the past? Okay. Uh, that is one thing, undirected, that's okay. That's a very common thing. It's not very weird, no? There is something that's weird about this graph. There, there are multi edges, no? There, there are multiple edges between pairs of nodes. I'm sure you wouldn't have seen that in your uh, course so far, right? So that's a little odd here, but anyway, it gives you the. Um, and so, what did Euler do? He proved that there is no Eulerian circuit in this graph. So, today we call it an Eulerian circuit in uh, Euler's honor. <coughs> and. Uh, of course, remember it's Euler, okay? It's, uh, you should always figure out how their uh, names are pronounced. Just like, you know, Westerners might, uh, <laughs> you know, clobber our names. We should also try to figure out how to uh, under spell their names right. 
So, so what are graphs? Just a quick intro because you already know they're very important theme in computer science and data science. Um, <clears throat> so it's defined by a set of vertices V and a set of edges E, which is uh, E is essentially in V cross V. Right? Some it's an, uh, it could be ordered also. If it is ordered, it's a directed graph and all that. You know all that. I'm not going to go into all of that. Now let's just think. How do you represent real-world networks as graphs, right? Say social networks or um, um, road networks, citation networks. I'll leave metabolic and gene regulatory networks for you, unless there are some uh, folks who already know a bit of biology. So then you can volunteer to answer this. But um, how would you cast these as graphs? I'll just come to that in a moment. I think I'm just mentioning some of these here for completeness. I know you already know these. Directed versus undirected graphs. So, example of a directed graph, right on your screen. Twitter is a directed graph, right? Facebook is an undirected graph, right? You know the concept of weights. Uh, very interesting. Um, did you use a weighted graph today? Anybody use Google Maps? It's a weighted graph, right? So, weighted either based on traffic or distance or tolls. You know, if you do a longer dis uh, longer uh, trip and so on. So, we keep using weighted graphs all the time. But what is the network there? What are the nodes and what are the edges? Have you stopped to think about it? In a Google map, buildings are nodes. Okay. Uh, okay, edges are roads. Okay, that is fine. But what, that is fine. But what are the nodes? Intersections, right? So junctions are the best examples. You can also put locations as nodes, but it just complicates the number of nodes, right? You'll have ten nodes next to each other, all connected on the single line or something like that. But that is also a reasonable representation. So, in fact, you will realize very quickly as, as you start modeling systems as graphs, there is no one correct representation for any system. It really depends upon the question you finally want to answer. You know, if you wanted to find the distance between two locations on the same road, they don't even exist if you started putting junctions as nodes as what I was saying. So, there is always an opportunity to model the graph the way you want to answer the questions that you want. Very interesting though, one departure I should tell you here, normally in any graph that you see in computer science, you have studied graph algorithms also, right? A few algorithms I at least I presume, do you know Dijkstra's algorithm? So there the, uh, the cost of, uh, I am sorry, the weight of an edge is a cost. So a weight is always negative, I mean meaning negative connotation, negative weight is a different story, we will come to that. But Meaning higher the uh, higher the weight, it is bad, right? Higher the weight means higher cost, longer distance, something like that. Whereas in biology, it's usually the other way around. Higher the uh, weight is usually a, a, a more confidence in an interaction or things like that. So not always in biology does uh, the weight denote a cost. It often denotes a confidence or a strength. So higher might be good. So that has its own ramifications. There are other graphs, uh, sparse versus dense, label versus unlabeled. Um, I think I'll I'll not belabor these at the moment. Uh, uh, have you studied bipartite graphs or hypergraphs? Okay, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, where there are uh, very uh, logical places where um, hyper. Okay, let's I think start talking about uh, bipartite graphs. Okay, and hypergraphs are sort of equivalent. Have any of you heard of the Kevin Bacon game? Does anybody know Kevin Bacon? I think, I think he was an actor, not a popular one, but they made a very popular game out of him. Right? If I tell some famous name like Robert Downey or something, you will all know. But this Kevin Bacon game was very popular in the 90s. So The, the idea was this, the game involved, um, they would give up the name of an actor let us say Robert Downey, okay? And you have to connect that actor to Kevin Bacon via movies, 
So we say that uh, Downey and X acted in a movie together, X and Y acted in a movie together, Y and Kevin Bacon acted in a movie together. So you are three hops from Kevin Bacon and that was like a silly game. And but it was a big hit apparently in the uh, 90s and um, so on. What is the network we are talking about here? It's a movie actor network. What are the nodes and what are the edges? Yes. Okay, so nodes are actors and edges are movies. Um, okay, so can you just uh, pick some movie and pick some actors and give me some names? I'll write. I'm going to put a round and Madhavan is it and I'm going to put an edge. I'm not going to necessarily have to label it, but let me label it in any case. Uh, can you mention some other, uh, um, some other movie with Amir Khan in it? Tare Zameen Par and uh, I don't remember the name of any other actor from that movie and I don't even know what the child was called. Darshan, okay, right, okay, and I'm just going to call this, I'm going to put an edge. And now, uh, can you name one more um, actor from um, Three Idiots? Salman, did I hear it right? Joshi, I'm going to write. I somehow didn't end up watching this movie. Okay. Now we have a problem here, right? Uh, and especially we'll have a problem So now did Madhavan and Amir Khan act in, uh, did um, Amir and, oops, this is correct, right? But then what does this mean? Did um, Amir Khan and Madhavan and uh, Joshi act in the same movie or they acted in three different movies? Is there a problem? You have a problem with this representation. So your graph framework has broken down in its description of this uh, co-actor network. I'll show you another way to do it. You have Amir Khan, Madhavan, Joshi, Excuse me, <laughs> that's supposed to be Tare Zameen Par. And now I'm going to draw it like this. Pakka, no confusion, very clear. This is a bipartite graph. Of course, bipartite graph can be de defined even more simply, but this is a very nice way to motivate a bipartite graph. Okay, so here you, here you have two types of nodes. Technical definition is the graph can be colored using two colors. You've already studied coloring, right? So this graph can be colored using two colors. So it's a, it's called a bipartite graph. Easier way for me to think about it is there are two shapes of nodes in the graph. Circles connect only to squares, squares connect only to circles, no circles connect to each other, no squares connect to each other. You can project this to get an actor-actor graph. You can project it to get a movie-movie graph, meaning which movies have similar actors that, and you can do all kinds of things, right? You all know about the Netflix price. Recommendation, right? It's a classic recommendation challenge. So basically Netflix will give you a list of users and their preferences. Can you predict what movie they would like to watch next? Very uh, famous uh, prize. So all of these you can see how you can cast it into a network and this is also, if you draw this, it automatically goes into the erase mode. This circle I just drew is a hyper edge. It's actually an edge. You are not used to that, no? For you an edge belongs to? But here in a hypergraph, edge belongs to? 
what is this 2 to the v? Remember power set from school? Any possible subset of v, right? In any combination of vertices, it could be one or more, right? And uh, of course, it should not be empty and all, but uh, roughly this is the thing. So, you can draw an edge through this. So, this is a hyper, hyper graph, so hyper edge, where you can capture multi-way relationships. Normal graph captures dash relationships, binary relationships, right? So, anyway, something new that you learn from today and in biological networks, hypergraphs are very useful. I yeah, will have metabolites and enzymes and things like that as two different types of nodes, very uh, logical way to represent these graphs and so on. Okay. So, why graphs? Uh, I may not need to convince you, but maybe you have a question. Do I know someone who knows someone who knows somebody, right? like a celebrity or something? How long is the chain to that person? Right? Uh, how difficult it is for me to get a meeting with that person right? or get an autograph from that person or whatever. And is everyone in the world connected to everyone else? You may have such uh, questions. Or who has the most number of friends? Who is most influential? And there are these kinds of questions. What are the least number of people I need to advertise to so that my product becomes viral? That's almost like a what problem? Digital marketing but graph theory. You might have heard of it. Vertex cover? Vertex cover problem. Right? I just need to find the fewest number of people so that the whole network is captured. Like I, my, my video goes, my advertisement goes viral. And our X and Y friends, this is a link prediction problem. Is this person your friend, right? The pop-up you will get on Facebook or something like that. And in fact, you will be surprised that, watch this slide carefully. I only change the questions. The methodologies remain the same. Right? So from here, to here, is there a way to produce a metabolite X from metabolite A, which is an existence of a path question. How long is that chain of reactions? Uh, basically the shortest path problem. Are all proteins connected to each other by a path? Trying to identify connected components. What is the most influential protein in a network? And in fact, I want to find these influential proteins in a pathogen like say the COVID virus and start designing drugs that will take down this influential protein. When you take this down, it is going to disrupt too much in the cell. It's probably going to kill the virus or things like that. And do proteins X and Y interact? So, same algorithm, guilt by association. X has friends or X has likings that are very similar. Y has likings that are very similar. So, X and Y are likely to be friends. X connects to very similar set of proteins. Y connects to very similar set of proteins. X and Y should be connected to each other. So, there are many problems that naturally map onto graphs, which is why graph theory is like really, really useful and I am glad you have already studied it in your uh, curriculum. And you might have heard of many of these problems, shortest path problem, traveling salesperson problem, finding uh, connected components, graph isomorphism, uh, vertex cover, minimum spanning tree, Hamiltonian, Eulerian path, all of these. Centrality measures you may not have heard of and I am going to spend some time on that a little later today. So, what is the role of graph theory in biology? Why do biologists worry about graph theory? Many, many applications and many biological problems naturally map onto graphs. Like path finding in metabolic networks, predicting protein interactions. No genome sequencing is possible without graph theory because genome sequencing is uh, you, you all must have heard that genome sequencing is the big thing, lots of uh, people doing genome sequencing. You can go and get your genome patri made and uh, stuff like that. So, all of these things are uh, possible today, but this requires, uh, the sequencing technology is very fascinating. What it does is it takes this long sequence, I don't know, do you know the length of your genome sequence? Huh. 3 GB. Right? 3 giga bases, my goodness. Right? So, 3 into 10 to the 9 bases, but you do not read it from start to end. What you do is you have some enzymes that will shatter this into pieces. You read, it is like you know taking a piece of, uh, taking a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, just mixing it. But actually the problem here is you make, take several copies of the jigsaw puzzle, mix it up and many pieces can go with each other. 
in your jigsaw puzzle only one piece can fit in only one place so it's uh, you can do a unique mapping and then from this complete mess you have to reconstruct the original genome sequence so this becomes very very challenging and there are beautiful graph algorithms that uh, underlie this and so on and then there are you try to identify clusters or modules in large networks right, community detection so this is very uh, is a very famous problem and uh, network biology has gained widespread popularity today um, where people construct and analyze a large um, set of biological networks. They could be protein networks, metabolite networks, enzyme networks, whatever. And lots of applications in machine learning and data science as well. And I think that will be very interesting to you. Can you learn on networks using community detection or using networks There are like various graph mining problems that people solve. And can you learn from networks, basically make predictions based on network information and things like that. So I will go into some of these problems today uh, um, uh, as time permits. So let us first start with the basics. How do you construct graphs with uh, these kinds of uh, networks? So can you tell me the answer to this one? Facebook, what are the nodes? What are the edges? Okay, people, friendships. Okay, Twitter, people, follows, protein interaction network, Any, anybody, anybody has done some biology, okay, at least a handful of people, okay, you, you can guess what is the pro protein interaction network, hmm, so some proteins, and um, maybe they are binding or something like that, right? And uh, gene regulatory network, again you can have genes and what gene activates another, what gene deactivates another and so on. So gene interactions, I will skip metabolic network, it can be a little too specific to my field, although it is like a lot of fun. Citation network, can you think of it? That is co-authorship network. Citation is papers will be the nodes. So one paper will say that I got this data from that paper. No, so that that is a citation. So the citations will be edges. And here authors and edges will be. This is like movies, right? Actors and movies. And again, you can imagine that a hypergraph will be a much better representation of this rather than regular graphs. Food web, S species, species of animals and what are the edges? Who eats whom? Right? Which animal eats which animal? Very interesting now. Protein structure. Protein structure itself is a network if you can imagine it that way. You might have seen some pictures, no? All of you must have seen that covid uh, protein <laughs> picture today. Hmm. Yeah, so it could be the 3D distance between the molecules, uh, between the atoms, so various things and even molecular graphs, this might sound like really weird but we use this to great effect once. So basically take every molecule as a graph and what you will have as a node are atoms and bonds. You can have even double bonds and this uh, three dimensional bonds in, in case of optically active molecules and things like that. So, okay, so here you go. Good? No surprises I think. This is all you are able to grasp all of this, excellent. Uh, various kinds of networks, so you see these pretty pictures to the right. So and you can see that they get very busy very quickly, lots of interactions, lots of nodes connecting to one another and uh, things like that and the cellular function itself is a result of all these lots of networks that exist. And um, how do you study these networks? 
and that is a very very interesting thing this is actually my last slide <laughs> but I'll, i can probably spend like one and a half hours on this slide because it's a very very uh, uh, interesting topic where like lots of interesting uh, questions can be answered so now that we've talked about graph theory and so on um, what is it that you really want to do with a graph you have a graph so what what do you want to do with it you know you can do dijkstra and uh, compute shortest paths and things like that what else would you like to do with a graph i'll tell you a few interesting things uh, i'll probably write down some of the things that you say on this slide uh, what will you do with a graph how would you want to analyze a graph you have the graph corresponding to so let me put it this way you can tell me a graph you would like to use and how you would like to work with it yeah so what will be your graph in that case very good so you want to do some gene disease but what should be your graph in the first place then hmm so you can think of a gene disease network is very much that okay in my other course on systems biology i do teach these kinds of networks so and you can start asking questions right which genes are involved in the same disease uh, which disease are impacted by the same genes uh, or uh, does a gene impact multiple diseases all these questions you can ask and answer okay any other network and what you would like to do with it genetic diseases okay hmm and so that could be inferred by the same network no potentially yeah absolutely good yes ant colonies okay how what kind of network you want to put up and how would you want to study the network hmm okay so um ant social network and network organization i'm already inserting one of my questions what are the ants that drive the show right what are the import and i would ask in fact this is very interesting for me we don't work with ants we work with microbes so and prate and uh, dinesh both of them work on these kinds of networks microbiome which is basically the collection of all microbiomes uh, uh, microbes could be on your skin it could be on your hair it could be in your gut and so on or it could be in the soil uh, wherever and same questions what are the important species which organisms are controlling the other organisms which organisms are helping the other organisms all these kinds of questions protein drug network very good so this is called drug repurposing because a drug is already there in the market it is approved for use for something else but today if you find that it is very efficient in fact there's this um, drug called indomethacin which is uh, i think used for treating um, muscular uh, some some problems also works um, very well against covid inflammation right so so these kinds of so it's a new function you don't have to go through elaborate trials and things like that as long as you can show that this is actually works and these hypotheses can start off from these kinds of networks you build a network and predict that this drug is going to have an effect on this protein or this disease maybe you can do some experiments to validate that in the lab so let me give you some other examples so how about an infrastructure network an r line network and you may ask the same question what are the most important airports what happens if tomorrow the russian airport has to be shut down for a week 
or Ukraine airports have to be shut down for a week. Or I don't know, there is some, some other problem and Dubai airport has to be shut down for a week. Or Mumbai airport, right? Once Mumbai airport is flooded, what do we do? Bangalore airport is likely to get flooded, what do we do? Right? So, these are all very interesting questions. So, what is the effect of perturbation on these networks? So, you can start answering all these kinds of questions using, well, using uh, graph theory or we typically use the term graph theory and network science pretty much uh, interchangeably. Network science is sort of more fancier and modern uh, term used to denote this, uh, this thing. And graph theory is generally a little bit more about the algorithms and stuff, whereas network science is more about uh, trying to identify important nodes, important edges, important groups of nodes and edges. This is classically some of the problems that we try to solve. How do I make uh, a video viral? I need to identify important nodes. Right? What is the most important uh, connecting flight? Right? Or what is the most important road in the city? Right? How I don't know how many of you got stuck in traffic while coming here. Right? So, you know that there are some roads, there will always be traffic on that. Madhya Kailash will always be, a, there will be a traffic jam because it is a very central Note. So, on the one hand, you will say that Dubai is a very important airport or Delhi is a very important airport because too many flights in and out. So, that is solely by number of edges coming in and going out of that vertex. But I said Madhya Kailash is very, very important. This, this road is very, very important. Always there is a traffic jam. Why is that important? There are only two roads that come in. From OMR road comes in, Sardar Patel road. Gandhi Mandapam Road, that's all. Only its, it's uh, number of uh, edges is only three. Why is it important? Volume of cars, but but what is that a uh, consequence of? Uh -huh. So it connects lots of important places. Meaning, to go between many pairs of places, you have to go through this road. So, are you now getting the feel for different measures of importance? One important is simply how many friends you have. That makes you very special. Or it could be that, you know, you are running a very important uh, information network where the information you pass to the other person is very important. So, even though you may know only two people or three people, you still have a very important role in the network or a traffic network for that example. So, there are different ways of identifying um, network uh, node importance in a network and so on. So, good time to take a pause and uh, you to come in or, uh, or should I at least uh, explain some of the concepts? Degree, okay. So, yeah and it is anyway post lunch. So, I do not want to be lecturing for too long, you will all doze off. So, what we will focus on is, there is a very nice uh, Python package called Network X and you can do lots of stuff very easily on it and uh, Dinesh and Pratya have put together a very nice uh, social network, they are uh, studying Harry Potter's social network and that is the uh, example graph for today and uh, you just uh, go to that and start uh, showing it. All of you have your laptops or no? Okay, so then you can just watch. We will share this with you. So, you will be anyway able to um, uh, run this at home and uh, so on. Okay. I, I think you are able to hear me, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So, I am Dinesh Kumar. So, I am working with Dr. Karthik Kamal. I am a student here. Okay, so today we will, so we have a Jupyter notebook here. Are you familiar with Jupyter notebook? Okay, great. So, uh, you said you are not very familiar with Network X. I am I'm not going to introduce you Network X, but I can share you some Jupyter notebook that would have like some introductory uh, you know, codes that would like make you familiar with how, how it works. It, it's just very simple, but, um, but right now, we'll jump into a few things. So, like Sir said, uh, I have a... Uh, so, I have a Harry Potter social network. Uh, I, I hope everyone knows Harry Potter. Have, is there anyone who have not seen Harry Potter? Okay. 
Okay, that's that's fine. That's good. Okay. Um, okay. So there are. Uh, uh, okay. So what I have done here. So I'll, I'll explain what what is there like one by one. First part, I have imported a few packages. Right, few packages that we are going to use for this demonstration, for this for this little experiment we are going to do. Mm, I have a lot of you can you can see I have a lot of packages. Network X, the the one that we are going to use. CSV is for CSV file handling CSV file. Um, okay, there are a lot of packages. So yeah, so once we have imported the packages, uh, I have the details, the data of the network here. In a GitHub page, I can just run this line. So if you want to run, so this is like a command line code. If you want to run a command line code, you just put an exc exclamatory in the beginning, and then you can just run it in notebook. So it, it's, it's run. So now it's it's loaded. You can see if you open, um, you have Harry Potter social network here, right? Yeah. Next. I am reading that CSV file using a package called pandas. Let's see how it looks. So this is this is basically a sample of the data we have. We have it is basically edge list. When we want to create a network, we can use we can use certain file formats to create a network. So one of its is an edge list. Edge list is nothing but you say which and which nodes are connected. So here the first Okay, I'll go with. So first, this Regis actors black and Sirius black is connected. What is their relationship? It's it's negative. They are they are uh, they are not in a positive relationship. They are in a negative relationship. They are so and then Sirius black and Dumbledore. You know they are positive relationship. So that's that's how this type is like a weightage of the now of the. You just, uh, you just, uh, this is good enough. I'll stand close to it. <laughs> you just uh, basically um, use list A and B are interacting, B and C are interacting, C and D are interacting. It's, it's a list, and you can imagine it's very inefficient, but it's, it's beautiful for exchanging graphs. If you want to quickly make a graph and send it to your friend, easiest way instead of you know making some matrix and all of that. This is very simple, right? Because logically, you may have assembled the network in this fashion. So, and this is easy. I know that Harry Potter has these interactions. So, I write down all these interactions. I make all this, this list is a flat file, three columns, CSV, source, target, type of interaction. I can obviously translate this into, a, into an adjacency matrix, adjacency map, adjacency list, whatever else I want to. Very easy for interchange of information. That's why he's loading it from there. Right. So we have loaded the edge list file. Now we'll create a graph using this file. Okay. So this is the function here. Uh, I'm using a function called from pandas edge list. Okay. So this is from network X. So this will create a graph called G. So we'll see how the graph looks. So this is the graph, right? Let me. So they are like, uh, okay. I think they have. I, I, I'm not sure. We can omit these self loops. Sometimes there'll be self loops. We can we can omit these in a graph. That's fine. So um, so you can see the the nodes, the big nodes, are those that are important. Here you can see obviously Harry Potter. You can see Voldemort. Uh, other people, Hermione Granger, Weasley, Dumbledore, all those people. So this mapping is based on one of the parameters that Sir was talking about, which is between the centrality. We'll get to that in a moment. So let me ask you a question. So can you tell me the five most connected people in this network? Sure. So, so that's it. Sir. 
So, I can say that Harry Potter, Lord Voldemort, Ron Weasley, Grange and Dumbledore are most connected. All right. Yeah. yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, okay, so I show between us also. So we, we said that there are two ways to say if a node is important. One is if the node has lots of connections or if it sits on lots of paths. Madhya Kailash is important because it sits on so many paths. If everybody is going from this part of the city to that part of the city, has to go through this road. So it is actually a measure of the number of shortest paths a node sits on. All of you have heard of page rank? How many of you have heard of page rank? Uh, what does page stand for? It actually stands for uh, Larry Page. <laughs> right? Because it was something that uh, it was his ranking. It finally ranks pages, but uh, it's uh, called page rank because it, uh, it, it ranks pages based on some notion of importance. Right? Do you know what that is roughly? Yeah. That is just degree, no? There is some one, one factor that you are missing out. Not really. Relevance keywords are similar. Just one more. All of you are right, but somehow you seem to be missing one important factor. All of you are right. Ah, you, are, you are slowly getting there. I want a better word for authenticity. Authenticity is nearly there. Okay, but how means what? You have to quantify it in some way. You have to either tell me authenticity or you have to tell me number of edges, number of websites that connect to this website, something. How many? Secure website, okay, secure authenticity, I'm going to sort of put it. Getting closer, so, it's very beautiful. Number of hits, you are all getting closer, very interesting. 
you first said number of links right that is just degree that is fine but now instead of number of links if you started adding a weight to the links how good this link is suppose you want to buy a uh, buy something right you will go and re read reviews on some popular website not on a random website because there is a notion of reputation or importance for the website this reputation is what page rank tells it so if more reputed or more important pages linked to a page that page becomes more important in fact please go back and read about eigen vector centrality beautiful right so instead of has saying that every node contributes equally towards degree important nodes contribute more towards degree right and this is basic notion of eigen vector centrality and it is extended in page rank in many beautiful ways okay so we have a few measures of importance now degree is a measure of importance betweenness how often is a node between other nodes is a measure of importance page rank is a measure of importance now so we calculated between the centrality for characters based on the relationship they have we can see that the most important characters comes up because you know harry potter is the most important he would have interacted with everyone and the next one is voldemort and then ron weasley hermione granger and dumbledore so so okay so i have sorted this i have just showing the top 5 uh, so this is like uh one of the way of using you know these centralities Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 so okay the first first list is sorted based on page rank so top 5 having highest page rank next is sorted based on between the centrality uh, you can see dumbledore has come up yeah and the next one is based on degree centrality like how many how many edges they have so you can see ron weasley is above uh, all the mont so yeah so so this is um this is about these centrality measures how, how to use parameters so i have used this character social network just just to like uh, motivate you I, I, like if i use some bio networks uh, uh that that would might be boring for <laughs> so okay so, so in fact my uh, uh, i have a collaborator uh, uh, we used to work on cancer genomics analysis and she wrote a blog article on doing the same thing for star wars social network She made a complete uh, analysis of uh, Star Wars characters, their interactions, who is the most uh, you know connected uh, character, and those kinds of things. So it it's can, a lot of fun. Yeah. So you, if you uh, if you don't know Star Wars, maybe like I have not seen much of Star Wars. I can just get this network and then run these things, and I can just say that who are the important characters, how are they related. There are networks for Game of Thrones, Star Wars, other novels too. some jane austen novels I'll, i'll maybe try to share you share this with you um, after this class yeah I, i'm not sure uh, dinesh will look into the data set did you like just uh, make a wrong uh, copy of a row or something why are there self loops self loops are actually something with data oh you oh you, yeah you got this data from somewhere i presume right yeah so we have to uh, we have to figure that out Yeah, no. It, it says the same person has a connection to the same person. I don't know. Did he put a spell on himself or something? I don't know. <laughs>
So maybe some more questions, right? So can you answer any of these questions using centrality measures or let me uh, put up a very interesting question uh, in the context of hopefully that this nonsensical pandemic is over. But in the context of the pandemic, suppose, right, I mean, we thankfully got lots of vaccines and stuff like that. But suppose vaccine supply was limited, we should have had a very smart vaccination plan. It would have been politically very difficult, right, because you can't say that I'll vaccinate these people before the other people or something, but we still did that for frontline workers and so on. But can you think of, suppose you have a social contact network. What is a social contact network? You both may not know each other or maybe you know each other, that's why you are sitting together. But in a social network, contact network, you have been exposed to him for the last three hours. Right? So that is a social contact network. So, in fact, this whole class is a sort of a clique, right? So, you know what's a clique? Everyone is connected to everyone in this class because you've been in social contact for the last three hours. But then, you know, the, um, the, the one who was recording these videos, he'll have a weak edge to you, right? He only comes here for a little time and things like that. In this social contact network, you may want to figure out, in fact, there used to be a very nice game which is now broken. And we couldn't retrieve the codes uh, as well. So, it's, it's, it, it was before COVID and all. It used to be the vaccination game. There will be a network where an infection is spreading. You have to click people to vaccinate them so that you curtail the spread of the epidemic. Right? It used to be called, if somebody can dig it through somewhere, uh, vax.herokuapp.com. I don't know if I found some video of it. You might find some video of it on YouTube at least. And I, maybe we should try to build it. One of you people can take it up as a project and build it. Right? <laughs> Not a very uh, difficult thing. So you have a network. How do you pick whom to vaccinate? Degree, betweenness, page rank. More infectious people. Who is most infectious? No? Maybe a bus driver or somebody? who comes into contact with so many people every day, right, rather than somebody else, right. Uh, uh, so, hospital, right, so frontline workers. So, you can come up with a very systematic plan based on this, this network. Right? Of course, it means that you should have a good network, otherwise garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have a good network, you can't make any useful uh, conclusions from that network either. So, our line network, we did a very interesting study recently. So suppose, you know, a network is under attack or it is, it fails, how do you repair the network very quickly? So can I have some additional flights that will ensure that the network is not congested and so on? Which edges, which pair of nodes do you connect? And then there will be a capacity restriction. You can't say, give me 10 more flights out of Delhi, not happening. So there's no time for launch, for uh, another flight to take off. So, you will have these kinds of constraints and with these constraints, can you find out the simplest edge additions to this network that will make it more robust. So all these kinds of questions can be answered using graph theory and network science. Okay. Okay, let's have a break, no? Uh, let's have a break for 5-6 uh, minutes and then we will uh, start. Yeah, feel free to get up, move out. <laughs> Wander and come back. <laughs> Where do you get the data? He'll share some resource. Yes, yes, I can share the slides. This, this video will also be online. The next very interesting concept I want to touch upon is that of network models. Meaning there are different types of networks that you encounter in, in the world. And do you have a model to capture the behavior of these networks? We always like to classify things, right? And then you say, okay, the, these kinds of networks behave in A fashion. These kinds of networks behave in B fashion and so on. And once you have that, it's very useful for making predictions and uh, you know, consolidating your understanding of these networks and so on. Very useful. And you've studied statistical testing, right? What is p-value? 
I'll simply define it very, uh, I'll, I'll not go into the math of it, but P value is a measure of surprise, actually the lack of surprise. Is that a fair description? Because lower the P value, very surprising, which means that you know you will throw away your null hypothesis, right, and accept the alternate hypothesis because your data is surprising you. Otherwise, you say, no, I am happy with the null hypothesis, alternate hypothesis is not justifiable in the context of my data. Am I right? But for this, you basically have this notion of an expectation. Your null hypothesis is basically like some base expectation, right, which is sort of nullified by some other data. So, suppose I have to say that this uh, Harry Potter network that uh, Dinesh showed, um, there is no structure in that network. People are just talking to each other at random. I could make an allegation of that sort, right? But then how would I validate or invalidate that claim? I need to have a base expectation or something like that. So, for example, what do I mean by a random network? Or what could I mean by a random network? Completely random, right? But can you get more specific? So now suppose I asked you to create a random network. How do you create it? What information do you need to create a random network? Shuffle the edges. So, you will need to know at least what is the size of the network, number of nodes and number of edges. So, this we typically call it as I call it G n comma P or G n comma M. M is number of edges, N is number of nodes. What is P? It's a probability, so it's basically make sense. This is nothing but density of the network, right? So th this is total possible edges, if everything is connected to everything versus number of edges that actually exist. So now, how do I create a random network? I take some n nodes and throw m edges at random. Hmm? So that would be a random network. So now I have to compare. So. Uh, Dinesh, uh, can you tell me how many nodes and edges are there in your Harry Potter network? Correct? So now I have to create a random network with 65 nodes and 333 edges and somehow compare the two. Is it, is the connectivity, what would I compare? Because somebody could say that Harry Potter is connected to some 65 people but no big deal This in this network that is what I would expect. I would expect at least one person to be connected to 65 people or something. But in reality no, right? What is your expected number of edges if there are 65 nodes and 333 edges, what is the average degree of the network? Because every edge will contribute to 2 degrees. Okay, I think I used the term degree a little prematurely. What is degree? Number of neighbors. So, Dinesh was also showing you degree centrality and so on. Degree is the number of neighbors. So, what is 332 into 333 into 2 by 65? It's about 10 only, right? What is it exactly? Ten.
10 point something. So, whereas uh, Harry Potter has a degree of 56, huh? 48, you know, much higher than average degree. And of course, this is just the average degree of such a network, but if you take a random network, where, so this, this assumes that edges are equally distributed. In a random network, we do not say that edges are equally distributed, that would be a very regular network. We are, say, we are saying that the edges are equally probable. Any two nodes have the same probability of being connected, no node is special. That would be what you define as random, no? if I have to do a fair allocation, suppose I have to pick 10 people from this class for, you know, for something, right? I would have to pick them at random. Right? Because there should be no, I should not be biased based on gender or state or any of those things, right? So, it has to be a random allocation. So, by random means there is some sort of everything is equal in front of a random um, assigner. So, one very interesting thing to study is what is the Degree distribution. What is degree distribution? The x axis is nothing but a histogram of degree. X axis is degree, y axis is probability of seeing a node with that, that degree or number of nodes with degree, that degree. Number if you normalize, you will get probability. How do you think this looks for random? Cannot look like this. This would be uniform. What is this? And this is actually weird. This says that every degree is equally likely. That is like a very weird thing. You could have something like this. What does this mean? All nodes have the same degree, 1.0. That is also weird. Something like this. But is this what you expect? In fact, what you expect is, so what is degree? Number of neighbors. So, if you are bringing it from a random process like this, what is degree? P is the probability of two nodes connecting. What is this distribution? This distribution is going to be? Yes. Why? Interesting. Because it is actually going to be binomial. And in the limiting case, it will be Poisson. Why binomial? Because? Every event has the same probability, you are counting the number of successes. Each time you have a success, you have a degree. So, you are counting the distribution of successes. So, it will be binomial and it will tend to pass on in, 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 you know, for appropriate cases and so on. And sometimes it will also look normal. So, the, the shape of this curve will look uh, weird, but you can always fit a proper Poisson distribution as uh, you were mentioning. So, do go and test this out and be convinced that if you actually connect every pair of nodes with equal probability, you will be able to, you will end up creating a network with a Poisson degree distribution, okay. So, this is one thing. Given a network, what are all the things that you want to study? How do you characterize a network? Suppose I gave you, so, suppose we want, we always want to complain, Chennai there is more traffic or Bangalore there is more traffic. You could say that the Bangalore network itself is bad. On, on what basis would you make that claim? So, things like that, right? So, you have to or you, you might say that, um, for example, you would say that in um, lots of European countries, the public transport is excellent. Whereas, you might say that in um, 
let's not public transport is is good but crowded in most countries let's let's talk about metro right in bangalore the metro is not great whereas in london the metro is much better why is that both cities are crazily populated both cities have uh, you know large metro traffic what is the problem you could say that bangalore or in chennai right the connectivity connectivity is poor how how do you characterize this connectivity the ease of the number of trains you need to take from one place to another is very large or there are some places that are not even connected to each other by a metro right of course if you take the whole public transport in the picture this, this will all come down very nicely right and you can in chennai or bangalore any place to any place you can go by bus for sure right and that way we will be very efficient uh, and so on so there are various parameters you can use to characterize a network first thing is degree distribution or that is one thing i already showed it's just this sort of a plot it looks like this or in some cases it look can look like this it can look like this and so on you have various kinds of degree distributions that you can have and then you have this notion of density it gives you some window into a network right more dense a network means it's more connected or something like that you you get a better uh, uh, more easy to reach that network or something like that what do you think is the diameter of a network what is the diameter of a circle it is the distance between farthest points on the circle right and it's the shortest distance between it is not the circumference right it's not the, the semi circumference it is the shortest distance between the farthest point so what is the diameter of a network longest shortest path right of all the shortest paths in the network which of them is the longest so what is the shortest path connecting the extremities of the network right so that is diameter you have something known as this is the max distance this is the so you will see that in india over the last say 15 years the characteristic path length the average number of flights you need to take between two uh, cities has drastically come down because you have many new airports and uh, things like that right and similarly um, you can look at it elsewhere in the world as well right so you will see that um, what is the average number of flights you need to take to go from one place to another in the world maybe not more than 4 or 5 that would be the diameter of the world right that is the max right what is the average number it might be just 2 2 or 2 and a half or something like that most times you should be able to take a single flight to your destination of choice or one connecting flight through a big hub make sense so these are all ways to characterize a network then you can look at number of connected components and various other things and then of course we talked about uh, degree centrality between a centrality page rank all these are measures to assess a network what's happening in a network and there is another very interesting thing known as clustering coefficient this asks the question if two people are connected what fraction of their friends are connected or let me put it more simply if a knows b and a knows c what is the probability that b knows c right. a and b are friends
do B and C also know each other? If they know, it, this is a triangle. Right? So, clustering coefficient basically co computes. So, CC of a node A is the number of number of triangles incident on A by total number of, so K is the number of neighbors of A. Maybe it's getting a little heavy. This is fairly simple, no? You, you've uh, studied more harder, con much harder concepts than this. So, this essentially tries to capture what is the level of clustering in a network or uh, maybe another term will be easy for you. How, how clickish is this network? You know what a click is? Everything is connected to everything. So, there the clustering coefficient of every node is 1.0. How much of a click is any given network is what this computes. So, why am I telling you all of these uh, parameters? Now, you can characterize networks. Let us say you want to break down a network. Okay. We want to take the COVID protein interaction network and damage it. Right. So, what nodes do you take out? What edges do you take out? Or how do you or how do you rank different strategies? Suppose you come up with a strategy. I'm going to take out the top nodes in a network. Maybe he comes up with a strategy that I'm going to take the nodes with the top between a centrality. And maybe she suggests that we should use page rank to disrupt a network. How do you conclude which is the best strategy? Well, you can try it out. But even when you try it out, how do you assess the impact? What will get impacted when you start breaking down a network? When a network starts disintegrating, how do you start measuring its impact? Diameter might increase, average path length, characteristic path length might increase, number of connected components will increase, the network will start getting fragmented. All these things you can use to um, <coughs> evaluate um, uh, a network. And very interesting, you can actually, one of the strongest strategies is you take between a centrality and recalculate after every removal. So, you take a node, take a network. Pick out the node with the highest between a centrality, remove it. But when you remove that node and it is obviously when you remove a node, you have to delete all its corresponding edges also. You then recompute the between us centralities. Again remove the top. When you do this, the network drastically breaks down. And these are the kind of attacks that you have to uh, protect against. Right? So, this could be a strategy that a terrorist uses on a power grid or on a, an airline network and so on. So, where do you build more redundancy? Where do you build more security? You could answer such uh, questions. And in biology also, we have very similar questions. Right? So, what is the most important network node? Or how do I, uh, how will this network break down? What are the genes that are very tightly connected to a disease? I will start using, you know, things like uh, there are um, uh, things known as community detection and so on. What are the groups of nodes that are close to each other? And basically, a, a sort of clustering. Have, have you studied clustering? Basic ML? K means and all you've studied. Huh. You can use concepts that are like that to cluster nodes in a graph and so on. So, lots of things you can uh, do. So, now that I've dis described some of the basic graph. Um, uh, Terminologies are, these are all parameters, clustering coefficient and clustering coefficient is defined for a node, whereas uh, density is defined for a network and of course, you can get average clustering coefficient for a network also and so on. Now, I told you how to create a random network. So, people first thought that well, random networks are uh, characterized by a, this L is stands for characteristic path length. 
very low. So the average separation between two network, two nodes in a random network is very low, which means that, and this is same for real networks also. So then are real networks random? That was the question that people had. And then they realized, no, real networks aren't random. In real networks, I see a lot of clustering. I'm sure when you came here, it was a surprise for you, right? You know that uh, somebody is somebody's friend and you already know that person and so on, small world. Yes? So, they, so real world networks show small, small world properties. And small worlds are nothing but clustering. You know A, you know B, you know C. B and C also happen to know each other. So, Watts and Strugatz In 1998, came up with this notion of small world networks. For this, what they did is very interesting. They said, let us first have a regular network. And here, nodes are connected to I shouldn't have put so many edges. Okay. So every node is connected to four nearest nodes on, two nearest nodes on either side. This is very regular. Homework, generate the adjacency matrix for this. It will be an exercise, you will understand how to do this and so on. So, what is the average degree of this network? Four. Every node connects to, what is the degree distribution? A spike at 4, that's all. All nodes have the same ready, no distribution. There is one point in the distribution, right? <coughs> and what they said is, if you start rewiring this network, and what do you mean by rewiring? You take the network and you reconnect at random meaning you erase this edge and, co and connect it here and you erase this edge and you instead uh, connect these two, something like that. So they defined a probability beta of rewiring. They said for some probabilities, you have networks that show two small world properties. One, low characteristic path length, because we saw that in random, we said that that is an important property of real world networks and high, what is it that we are talking about? High clustering and low path lengths. And they, and they call these small world networks, okay. So in small, and there is a very nice book called, um, I have the picture of the book on my other slide. It is called, uh, I think just uh, uh, small world or something like that. I um, will bring it up at the end of the class. It is by uh, Duncan Watts. Uh, I think it is called small world, I think. So both low characteristic path length and high clustering. But then what they found was, real networks, the degree distribution looks still very similar to random networks, not like very different, it is obviously different, but it is very different from real networks. Real networks typically have a very weird degree distribution. Can you imagine how the degree distribution of real world networks looks like? 
like airports. How many flights out of Dubai versus how many flights out of Port Blair? Very skewed, right? So, real world networks typically have a degree distribution that looks like this. This is of course K, this is N of K. What does this mean? I'll, I'll circle two points here. What do these two points mean? Interpret the graph for me, interpret the histogram, the distribution. Can you raise your hand? Huh? Huh, there are many airports with very low number of connections, two, three flights out of that airport. And there are, but there are few airports with huge number of connections. So, these are called as hubs, periphery. That is very interesting. And there is something else in the world that follows this pattern. Wealth distributed like that, right? There are few people who have a lot of wealth and the large number of people who have, you know, normal or low amounts of wealth and things like that. And in fact, Barabasi and Albert, they were two scientists, very interesting. They suggested that you can create these networks using a rich get richer algorithm. Technically, it is called preferential attachment and what do we mean by rich get richer? If a node already has more connections, it will get even more connections. Right? See, popular people, how difficult it is to, I do not know if any of you have tried to build a new YouTube channel or something like that. It can be quite a challenge, right? How do you get subscribers? Other channels, they already have subscribers, they keep getting more subscribers, right? So, there is the rich get richer. Of course, there is a very nice uh, paper that talks about how you just need to do one or two good videos to get more subscribers to your channel and uh, uh, th things like that. But there is basically a complete science underlying this and these are called as power law networks because the degree distribution follows a power law. And what is the power law? P of K is Proportional some k to the minus gamma and if you take log, no, you will get a line like this, straight line and that, that means that there is a long tail. This tail is very interesting. It means that at these high k's, you still have a decent number of nodes showing this kind of behavior. You have a few nodes that have very, very high degree. So, these are the hubs and so incrementally, and so these nodes, these networks show low path lengths, in fact very low path lengths. So L is log log n, very very small and very high clustering and very real life degree distributions. So you look at internet and all that, degree distribution is like this. Now an important question for you. How do you think these networks perform with respect to A, failures? What is a failure? A, a node just breaks down or attack. Attack is somebody targets what is likely an important node in the network. So how does a power law network behave under failure or attack? Thoughts? Uh, so, if you target hubs, the network will disintegrate fast, but random failures won't affect the network because it, only a peripheral node is likely to be uh, affected at random, right? Because there are more, suppose said, and that's why the internet works. By chance, some 10 routers fail, some 10, 20 people will get disconnected from the internet. But then, uh, some uh, four or five years back, we had a problem where uh, some major cables got cut or there was a... Uh, a power outage in both the east coast and the west coast of the US and for a couple of days at least I think I couldn't access Dropbox and all of that and that's because you know your hubs got, your hubs failed 
Hums are not likely to fail, but if they fail, you are in deep trouble. So, but this is a, a natural um, consequence of how these networks are wired. Okay. So, so with that, we've sort of covered a lot of concepts today. I think it's uh, overdose. I'll let you soak in uh, all of that. But to briefly recap, I introduced you to the history of networks, graph theory, Euler and so on. And then we looked at some simple networks and we looked at the concept of hypergraphs and bipartite networks which are very relevant. And then a few network parameters. How do you say that a particular node is important or not important and so on. Okay. So you could, and there are different notions of importance, right? Because there are some roads which have only two incoming, jun some junctions which have only two roads, but they are very important. And uh, there are other node, uh, roads which have uh, many junctions and are therefore important. So one is important by virtue of its degree, other is important by virtue of its betweenness centrality or page rank. Right? So Harry Potter was important on the basis of page rank, betweenness centrality and degree, whereas uh, Voldemort, huh? no, some other one was important based on page rank and Ron Weasley or someone was uh, important on the basis of between a centrality. So you have these very interesting ways to look at the same network and ask and answer different kinds of questions. And then we looked at a bunch of network parameters. First is density, degree distribution, diameter, characteristic path length, number of connected components, uh, clustering coefficient, all these are ways to study a network. And these are all very important concepts and you can also quantify the disruption of a network. So suppose you come up with a strategy to disrupt a network, take between a centrality and start breaking down a network. You will see that diameter increases, characteristic path length increases and so on. And then we discussed three random network, three network models. One is a random network model. One is uh, the small world model of Watson Strogatz. And um, uh, Watts uh, book was called Six Degrees. No, uh, not small world networks. So, so the book was titled Six Degrees. You may have heard the famous uh, phrase Six Degrees of Separation and things like that. And uh, then there is also this book called Linked by Barabashi, who is the author of the, I didn't write uh, his name there. Uh, Barabashi and Rekha Albert, they have this, um, and of course random networks are proposed by Urdush and Rini. This was sometime in, I think, 60s, very early. Okay. So, we then talked about these three different kinds of networks and these networks have lots of applications in biology and uh, you folks already gave me a lot of interesting applications. We talked about gene disease networks or ant social network, uh, microbiome analysis, protein drug networks and uh, so on or even social contact networks for vaccination and things like that. So there are lots of applications for network biology. I mean, uh, if you look at my uh, lab web page, you will see that we have used it in so many different uh, scenarios. We study metabolic networks, we study protein interaction networks, we study microbial interaction networks and so on and so forth. There are so many applications for networks in biology. I did not want to go too deep into biology today. So I just sort of uh, brush the surface of uh, network science. And one thing very important I want you to take back uh, home from, uh, from today's uh, workshop is that you can use network X and it is very easy to use Python package to do whatever you want in networks. So you should try and study um, about uh, network X, it has a very good tutorial and all of that. And uh, next thing you have is community detection. Huh? What is the, what do you have after this, 4 o'clock what do you have? Do you have energy for more or you want to close it? This is interesting, so I think you folks have lots of energy, I would imagine. You are all used to, uh, you are bored of online classes, so offline you must be more energetic and enthusiastic. 
right? Part of this paradox, right? <laughs> so, so what do we, um, uh, how do you identify communities in networks? This is a very nice uh, story. I will show you this one picture and uh, talk about it. Even if you don't remember some of the concept discussed, you should remember the uh, seven bridges of Koenigsberg and all these stories that we discuss. So the other story I'm going to talk to you about today is called Zachary's Karate Club data set. So 1977, this uh, social network scientist called um, um, Wayne Zachary was uh, building a Karate Club data set. He was studying a Karate Club in, in the US and uh, the social network, it, who is friends with whom in the club and so on. And as luck would have it, during this course of the study, the club, the Karate Club had a fight. And, uh, and the uh, club split into two. And it turned out that based on the connections between the people, uh, they could very exactly predict which two people formed the two new clubs that came out of this Karate Club. Okay, so, so you can see these two colors, right? So, so you can see the split of nodes between the two groups. And apparently, this is a very, uh, uh, very, very famous. So, if you go to some network conference, you will uh, see people wearing a t-shirt saying, if your algorithm does not work on the Karate Club data set, go home. <laughs> and uh, there is a Karate Club club uh, where they, <laughs> this is a small trophy that is passed on to the first person who presents, who mentions the Karate Club data set in a networks conference. Okay. So, you have all these silly insider uh, jokes. Anyway, the, the thing is, how do you identify this community? So, how do you characterize this closeness and things like that? This becomes a very interesting question. So, uh, you can read a lot more about it. In fact, you can even use clustering. So, you take nodes and you calculate, you compute their properties based on the graph, not based on other things. You know, how many paths are there between the nodes, how many paths of length 3 are there between the nodes, something like that. And you can cluster, use k-means clustering to make this network break down into clusters. Have you studied hierarchical clustering? Yeah. Huh, yeah, dendrogram kind of thing. Yes? So, very interesting. So, I will just give you a flavor of that because it's very uh, <laughs> nice to think about it. So, there is a very famous network scientist called Newman. You can go and read more about him. So, Gierman and Newman have a very interesting algorithm for community detection. What they say is simple. You take this network and you compute the between -is centrality of every edge. Okay? And you take the edge, edge with the highest between -is centrality, remove it. Repeat. Again, recompute the between the centralities. Again, remove the edge with highest between the centralities. Again, recompute, again, remove. Recompute, remove. Recompute, remove. At the end of it, what do you have? You will have a network with n nodes and zero edges. Now, play the video backwards. So, you will get. So, now I will draw your dendrogram. So, this is how the network looks at the end, correct? Zero edges. Now, I draw an edge between these two and then maybe these two get connected and then these get connected and then these two, these two. Whole network is now connected, right? I mean, uh, you, you have to assume that the, these edges are connecting this group to that group and things like that. But what you can now do is, if I cut here, I will get some communities. So, if I cut here, <laughs> I get a, every node becomes an individual community of its own. So, you can appropriately cluster the network or identify communities in this network. And you want to just quickly demonstrate that for Harry Potter? So, these algorithms are all built into Network X. So, all you have to do is just read and understand a little bit about the algorithm and use it in Network X. Of course, implementing it on your own will give you a lot of experience and learning. Okay, I'll, I'll just keep quickly slow. So, how to use Network X to find communities? 
I have refreshes, I'll just run these things quickly. I'm just loading the network, building graph. All right. So now we have the graph. Uh, so we'll we'll try to use um, given name and algorithm to find communities in this Harry Potter network. So I've had code. So first, uh, first this set tries to find communities. We'll give an output, call this uh, community generator. We use that community generator to uh, separate our different nodes. We color these node for visualization. You can see. different set of clusters. You have the Dursleys here, the Riddle family here. You have some, um, okay, I'm just searching for Harry Potter, okay. You have a green family here, you have a, right, I think this blue is like the bad guys and the green is the good guys. Red is a single. So this is this is like you can try to uh, you know op optimize this using some some how how many how many communities you want you can like fix it like server showing you where to cut those things. Um, so this is this is just a sample of how to use network X to find communities. Um, so this is for a like legit uh, Harry Potter. So what, what if we try to find communities for a random network? Yeah, so I, I'm just generating random network. Um, so, I, I, so, okay. I'm just mapping it. So I generated a random network which has same nodes, uh, same number of nodes as that of the Harry Potter network and slightly equivalent number of edges. So you can see, so this is this is a, from the random network. You can see, you can see that most of these characters have like almost similar, similar edges. It's like 16, 15, 15, 15, 15, 13, 13, 14. So let's see how, how the communities are generated here. See, uh, it's, the, All right, so here it is showing in the mapping. It's, it's, it's not going up. So I, I try to label these. So, uh, so here's the thing, you, can, you cannot see like communities like you saw in the higher border network. Um, that's, that's the thing. So, So in Harry Potter network, you saw different communities of, you know, proper proper communities of characters. But but when you randomize these network, it's like you're disrupting all the information. And then you see, you, you won't see proper communities.
So we are importing, so it's, it's under communities. So I'm importing from network X dot algorithm. So I'm importing something called community. From there, there is this function called Girvan Newman. So you just given the graph uh, that you have, it will create an iterator. Iterator is nothing but at different levels, how many clusters you have. You can use the iterator. So if you want like, um, at some fourth level you want, you can, can just iterate it to fourth level and then you can just find the clusters there. So, uh, if you have any doubts, I'll, I'll share this network, sorry, this Jupyter notebook with you. Uh, I'll, it has comments here and there, help you go through it. The error is gone. Link is there, right, right. The link is there. I'll also send you uh, through some common email that you have. Yeah. I've added some resources that you were asking about where I took these uh, networks and stuff. I hope you got a quick intro to networks. I think networks are a very interesting aspect of uh, any field and um, Lots of applications. I didn't really go into the biology applications, but uh, I had a few things on my slides. Maybe I can just show some predicting essential genes and protein interaction networks, or uh, disease modules in biological networks. Predicting you might have solved this in school. You have a molecule on the left hand side, molecule on the right hand side, what reactions? So some you would have, some organic chemistry reactions you would have memorized, some diels alder reaction and things like that. But can we actually predict that based on your knowledge of uh, databases? So some graph mining here. So lots of interesting applications. And yeah, so if you want to learn more, you can read this uh, book on networks by Mark Newman. Or, uh, this is my textbook on uh, systems biology, where the first part is on networks. Very interesting book called uh, Bioinformatics Algorithms. This talks about all your genome assembly using uh, graph theory and uh, things like that. So let me know, write to me if you have any questions or you want to learn more. And uh, yeah, these are a lot of students and collaborators that contributed to many of these projects. I would like to thank them too. We're done, uh, but uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll hang around here for a little while. Happy to answer them. What projects? Lots, lots, including those that I just showed. So you can look at uh, this in my webpage. I think we'll have like some 20 different things that we've done with networks easily. It is very complicated. It, it is very complicated. That's why biological network analysis is very challenging. But then there are ways to identify this, right? So there are ways to identify which reactions are more important in a network, which reactions you can uh, meddle with in a network and things like that. So we have also developed some algorithms and lots of algorithms to study this systematically. It's all molecular recognition, right? So it's it's very fascinating. So there is a protein code, essentially, and uh, very specific, right? I mean, so specific that your vaccine elicits a response against Delta, but not against Omicron, 
right? So, there is so much of molecular specificity that is involved. And for those of you wondering, uh, you do not have to know much biology to do this kind of stuff. I know very little biology myself. You know, the basic concepts are important, but uh, but I will promise you that they make biology really boring in school and real life biology is much better than that. So, no taxonomy, no flowers, no parts of the flower. <laughs> Molecular biology is very quantitative and if you look at things like uh, ma these, you know, microbiome or networks and things like that, it's very, very exciting stuff. So, you can boldly jump into these projects. Uh, some of you want to do some interns or some projects, just write to me. We have lots of uh, exciting network stuff to work on and things like that. Email ID is uh, K Raman. Yeah. Hmm. See, basically, you know, you you compute some sort of uh, correlations. How often this, is this micro present with the other micro across samples? Something that Pratya does a lot, right? And you use that to identify edges between. Uh, microbes. This is from experimental data, right? So, there are data sets. So, there are what are known as metagenomic data sets. They tell what are all the microbes present in a particular environment. Okay. So, in soil, you find all of these microbes. So, you see this A, B and C coexist. And then you find that they exist in the gut also. They exist in the skin also. And then you start drawing a thick, strong edge between these microbes and things like that. Yes? Sequential way to? So, you, 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 you just have to, uh, uh, you have to sacrifice on something. So, you can, uh, uh, you do not need to recalculate the betweenness. But here, it is it's tricky. I do not know how you will use parallel here because there is, uh, Different states, no? So, that's a very good question. So, um, you, you can maybe think of this as an optimization problem, right? So, which nodes do I minimally remove to disrupt the network or something like that? And that you can solve in parallel, right? You can have many, uh, many algorithms, instances of the algorithm exploring different strategies and then they can collate their answers and things like that. So, that yeah, yeah. Ah, so, so that is actually used in drug discovery and all of that. So, uh, 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 very useful. See, essentially and there is also this graph to vec and things like that. You might have heard of node to vec and things like that. So, Take a graph and learn a latent representation for the graph and try to make uh, predictions on that. Or similarly, you know, you can also use uh, a graph neural network for, for problems involving graph objects. Right? Suppose you want to uh, predict a new drug, right? So, you can look at it in neural network space or you can look at it in the, look at it in the latent space and things like that. Lots of uh, things are possible. Yeah. Should maybe stop by my lab and talk to some of our students. <laughs> Biotech building, block 2. You can ask uh, Pratyay and Dinesh to take you. I don't know where Prashant sits though, right? I don't know if he's in DSI or uh, uh, fifth floor. We also have the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI there. Okay, so let us formally close, but I will hang around. So, if you have some questions, just stop by and we can chat.
but the some people might want to just relax after a long day.